Welcome everybody to Deep Learning. So today we want to continue talking about the different losses and optimization. We want to go ahead and talk a bit about the details of these interesting problems. We have a search technique which is just local search, gradient descent, mm -hmm. to try to find a program that is running on these recurrent networks such that it can solve some interesting problems such, such as speech recognition or machine translation and something like that. Let's talk first about the loss functions. Loss functions are generally used for different tasks and for different tasks you have different loss functions. The two most important tasks that we are facing are regression and classification. So in classification, you want to estimate a discrete variable for every input. This means that you want to essentially decide in this two-class problem here on the left, whether it's blue or red dots. So you need to model a decision boundary. In regression, the idea is that you want to model a function that explains your data. So you have some input function, let's say x2, and you want to predict x1 from it. To do so, you compute a function that will produce appropriate values of x1 for any given x2. Here you can see this is a line fit. We talked about activation functions, last activation as softmax and coarse entropy loss. Somehow we combined them and obviously there's a difference between the last activation function in our network and the loss function. The last activation function is applied to the individual samples x of the batch. It will also be present at training and testing time. So the last activation function will become part of the network and will remain there to produce the output or the prediction. It generally produces a vector. Now the last function combines all M samples and labels. In their combination, they produce a loss that describes how good the fit is. So it's only present during training time and the loss is generally a scalar value that describes how good the fit is. So you only need it during training time. Interestingly, many of those loss functions can be put in a probabilistic framework. This leads us to the maximum likelihood estimation. In maximum likelihood estimation, just as a reminder, we consider everything to be probabilistic. So we have a set of observations, capital X, that consists of individual observations. Then we have associated labels. They also stem from some distribution and the observations are denoted as Y. Of course, we need a conditional probability density function that describes us somehow how y and x are related. In particular, we can compute the probability for y given some observation x. This will be very useful, for example, if you want to decide on a specific class. Now we have to somehow model this data set. They are drawn from some distribution and the joint probability for the given data set can then be computed as a product over the individual conditional probabilities. Of course, if they're independent and identically distributed, you can simply write this up as a large product over the entire training data set. So you end up with this product over all M samples where it's just a product of the conditionals. This is useful because we can determine the best parameters by maximizing the joint probability over the entire training data set. We have to do it by evaluating this large product. And, and you know, nothing in, in machine learning is exact, right? Now, this large product has a couple of problems. In particular, if we have high and low values, they may cancel out very quickly. So it may be interesting to transform the entire problem into the logarithmic domain. Because the logarithm is a monotonous transformation, it doesn't change the position of the maximum. Hence, we can use the log function and a negative sign to flip the maximization into a minimization. Instead of looking at the likelihood function, uh, 
we can look at the negative log likelihood function. Then our large product is suddenly a sum over all the observations, the negative logarithm of the conditional probabilities. Now we can look at a univariate Gaussian model. So now we are in the one-dimensional domain again and we can model this with a normal distribution where we would then choose the output of our network as the expected value and 1 over beta as the standard deviation. If we do so, we can find the following formulation. Square root of beta over square root of 2 pi times the exponential function of minus beta times the label minus the prediction to the power of 2 divided by 2. Okay, so let's go ahead and put this in our log likelihood function. Remember, this is really something that you should know in the written exam. Everybody needs to know the normal distribution and everybody needs to be able to convert this kind of univariate Gaussian distribution into a loss function. If we do so, you will see that we can use the logarithm it comes in very handy because it allows us to split the product here. Then we can also see that the logarithm cancels out with the exponential function. We simply get this beta over 2 times y subscript m minus y hat to the power of 2. We can simplify the first term further by applying the logarithm and pulling out the square root 2 pi. Then we can see that the sum over the first two terms is not depending on m, so we can multiply it by capital M in order to get rid of the sum and move the sum only to the last term. Now you can see that only the last part here actually depends on w. Everything else doesn't even contain w. So if we seek to optimize towards w, we can simply neglect the first two parts. Then we end up with only the right part here on the right hand side. You see that if we now assume beta equals 1, then we end up with exactly 1 over 2, the sum over the square root of the differences. This is nothing else than the L2 norm. If you would write it in vector notation, you would end up with this here. Of course, this is equivalent to a multi-dimensional Gaussian distribution with uniform variance. Okay. So, well, there's not just L2 losses, there's also L1 losses, so we can also replace those. And we will look at some of the properties of different L norms in a couple of videos as well. It's generally a very nice approach and it corresponds to minimizing the expected misclassification probability. It may cause slow convergence because they don't penalize heavy misclassified probabilities but they may be advantages in extreme label noise. Now let's assume that we want to classify, then our network would provide us with some probabilistic output P. Let's say we classify only into two classes. Then we can model this as a Bernoulli distribution where we have classes 0 and 1. Of course, the probability of the other class is simply 1 minus p. This then gives us the probability distribution p to the power of y times 1 minus p to the power of 1 minus y. Typically, we don't have only two classes. This means we need to generalize to the multinully or categorial distribution. Then y is typically modeled again as one hot encoded vector. We can then write down the categorical distribution as the product over all the classes of the probability for each class to the power of the ground truth label, which is either 0 or 1. Let's look at an example of a categorical distribution. The example that we want to take here is a Bernoulli trial, a coin flip. We encode heads as 0, 1 and tails as 1, 0. Then we have an unfair coin and this unfair coin prefers tails with a probability of 0.7. Its likelihood for heads is 0.3. Then we observe the true label y as tails. Now we can use above equation and plug those observations in. This means we get 0.3 to the power of 0 and 0.7 to the power of 1. 
something to the power of 0 always equals to 1. Then 0 0.7 to the power of 1 is of course 0 0.7. And this then means the probability to observe tails for our unfair coin is 70%. We can always use the softmax function within the network to convert everything into probabilities. Now we can look at how this behaves with our categorically distributed system. Here we simply replace our conditional with the categorical distribution. This then gives us a negative log likelihood function. Again, what we're doing here is of high relevance for the written exam. So everybody should be able to explain how to come from a probabilistic assumption to the respective loss function in the categorical distribution. So here we again apply the negative log likelihood. We plug in the definition of the categorical distribution, which is simply the product of all our y subscript k hat to the power of the ground truth label. This can be further simplified because the product can be converted into a sum by moving in the logarithm. If we do so, you can see that the power of the ground truth label can actually be pulled in front of the logarithm. We see that we exactly end up with cross entropy. Now, if you use the trick with the one hot encoding again, you can see that we exactly end up with the cross entropy loss where we have the sum over the entire set of observation times the logarithm of the output at exactly the position where our ground truth label was one. Hence, we neglect all the other terms in the sum of the classes. Uh, also because I'm lazy, so you know, kind of. <laughs> Interestingly, this can also be put in relation with the kalberg liebler divergence. The KL divergence is a very common construct that you can find in many machine learning papers. Here you can see the definition. We essentially have an integral over the entire domain of X. It's integrating the probability of P of X times the logarithm of P of X divided by Q of X. Q of X is the reference distribution that you want to compare to. Now you can see that you can split the two parts using the property of the logarithm. So we get the minus part on the right hand side, which is the cross entropy. The left hand side is simply the entropy. So we can see that this training process is essentially identical to minimizing the cross entropy. So in order to minimize the KL divergence, we can minimize the cross entropy. You should keep that in mind. This kind of relationship appears very often in machine learning papers. So you find them easier to understand if you have these things in the back of your mind. Now, can we use cross entropy for regression? Well, yes, we can do that, of course, but you have to make sure that your predictions are going to be in the domain of 0 and 1 for all of your classes. You can, for example, do this in a sigmoid activation function. Then you have to be careful because in regression, typically you are no longer one hot encoded. So this is something that you have to deal with appropriately. As seen before, this loss is equivalent to minimizing the KL divergence. Let's summarize what we've seen so far. So L2 loss is typically used for regression. Cross entropy loss is typically used for classification, typically in combination with one hot encoding. Of course, you can derive them from ML estimators from strict probabilistic assumptions. So what we're doing here is completely in line with probability theory. In the absence of more domain knowledge, these are our first choices. If you have additional domain knowledge, then of course, it's a good idea to use it to build a better estimator. The cross entropy loss is intrinsically multivariate. So we are not just stuck with two class problems. We can go into multidimensional regression and classification problems as well. Next time in deep learning, 
we want to go into some more details about loss functions and in particular we want to highlight the hinge loss. It's a very important loss function because it allows you to embed constraints. We will see that there are also some relations to classical machine learning, pattern recognition and in particular the support vector machine. In the 80s I thought about how to build this machine that learns to solve all these problems. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I'm looking forward to welcoming you in the next one. Bye bye.